Dr. Kevorkian? Hello? Dr. Kevorkian? Hey, Dave. Have you seen Dr. Kevorkian? I can't find him anywhere. No, maybe he's with Chevy. What's he doing with Chevy? I don't know. Chevy! <laughs> Chevy? Oh, hi, Ron. What's up? Hi. Uh, sorry to bother you. Have you seen Dr. Kevorkian around? No, I haven't. Try the green room. Oh, okay. See you later. Okay. Oh, and Ron? Yeah. Uh, get somebody in here to cut me down, will you? I finally got this kink out of my neck. And... Sure thing. Thanks. <laughs> It's the Chevy Chase Show from Hollywood. Tonight, actor-director Robert De Niro. Supermodel and professional volleyball player Gabriella Reese. Actor and screenwriter Chaz Palminteri. And 88-year-old jazz musician Doc Cheatham. News update. And Tom Scott in the Hollywood Express. Now, here he is. Chevy Coming. Oh, you're. Thank you. Thank you very little. Anybody watch the president's speech last night? I'd like to pass along an idea that I, I that could help the cost of medical treatment. Maybe silly, but you know everybody could take the lint out of the filters of their clothes dryers and make surgical cotton. <laughs> hey, we got a great show for you tonight. Robert De Niro is here. Actor, screenwriter, Chaz Palminteri, supermodel. Uh, supermodel and professional uh, volleyball player, Gabriella Reese. Yeah. About this call. Also, Nightly News Update, and Tom Scott on the Hollywood Express. Tom. Thank you. Looks to me like you got a new member of the band here. Uh, what's well, the deal? we do, Jeff. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce on trumpet. He's 88 years young. Please welcome Doc Cheatham. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right, let's go. Yes. It's a funeral march. You know, we're going to do something uh, a little bit new here tonight. Uh, I love music. Unfortunately, the only instrument I know how to play a little bit is the piano and the drums. I'm not a bad drummer. <laughs> but I always wondered what it would be like to play another instrument, so I thought I'd call a violin teacher in the Yellow Pages and we'll just ask for a trial lesson. This is real. We'll see what happens, okay? So we'll just open up the Yellow Pages to any page. <laughs> I, wa I want you to know something, though. That these people have no idea who's going to call. They just know somebody's going to get some kind of a call. We'll see what happens. Get out my... All right, let's dial it in. Dave's accordion school. All right. Do I have to dial one first, Mike? 
I guess you did. All right. One. Hello, David Accordion School. Yes, who am I speaking with, please? Hi, this is, uh, this is Veronica. Veronica? Yes. Hi, uh, this is, uh, Chevy Chase. How you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm fine. D did I interrupt you? Uh, excuse me? I said, did you interrupt me? <laughs> Chevy Chase? Hello? I think I can still hear you. Can you hear me good? You know, uh, uh, you're, you're Veronica, right? I, I was wondering, I, I was reading in here that you're not, you don't only teach accordions, but you teach uh, uh, violins. Is that true? Veronica? <laughs> Veronica? <laughs> Next one? Huh? Go ahead and try one more time. Do I have to match? Same number? All right, here we go. Poor kid. I feel bad for her. <laughs> Hello? Veronica. Yes. Don't ever hang up on me again. Um, I didn't hang up. I think you cut me off. Veronica, uh, I, w the reason I'm calling is I was thinking of learning a different instrument. I, I can play the piano, but I was thinking about uh, learning the violin. And you do teach violin, do you not? Uh, yes, I do. Yes, Thank I do. Thank me. Um, I'll tell you why. Uh, I, could, is it possible that I could get a lesson uh, today so that uh, I could play happy birthday for somebody a little bit later? Um, well, I don't think you could learn it uh, that fast. Oh, well, well I, I only have a few minutes. Uh, I have a violin right here. Maybe you could just help me. Is this in tune? I uh, guess uh, close enough. Oh, good. Then uh, if you just give me a couple of pointers, I have a bow and a violin. Can you, can you do this, do you think? Uh, just well, tell me. Yeah, go ahead. How do I hold the bow? How do you hold the bow? Yeah. Um, well, the thumb and the uh, third finger have uh -huh. to form a circle around the lower edge of the... Of the uh, of the stick, which is called the nut. I got it, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm, yes. And those are the main holding fingers. And then the other fingers yeah. just sort of um, wrap around the stick. Okay. Wrap around right at that point. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. And uh, uh, now, when I, when I actually play the strings, uh, do I run the bow across the strings? Um, well, yeah. The hair side goes right on the strings, perpendicular to the strings. Mm-hmm. How's this? Uh, right between, you know where the bridge is? Do you know where the bridge on the violin is? Yeah. Uh, the bridge and the uh, fingerboard, right in between those two. Oh, yeah. Right, okay. Right. Yeah. Kind of I got it. And there's something here. There seems to be something here for my, uh, either my chin or my back. I... Okay. Right. Well, you hold the violin, of course, with your left hand, and you uh, put it up to your, to your left jaw. Okay, I got your, it. Side of your face. Thank you. Now, uh, what should I do next? Just place the bow lightly on the strings? Uh, yes, right about the middle of the bow. You place the bow at the middle point of the bow on uh, the string. You got it, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And uh, is this really happening right now? What happened? Oh, I'm just wondering, are you really doing... Okay. Can you hear it? Hear it. See? Yeah, well... Um, now, I just want to learn happy birthday, Veronica. We don't have to... And we're going to pay you, so please, concentrate. Um... <laughs> Let's see, um, you, you'd have to set three of your fingers uh, right on the, um, the third string, actually. Oh, you got actually, it. you could just play in rhythm. You don't even have to play fingers. You just play in rhythm. Just play in rhythm? Yeah, play in rhythm. Okay. Ready? Um, uh, yeah, um, just, just play happy birthday to you and take it on the third string, I guess. Yeah. Have you had anything to drink? Um, just coffee. <laughs> That's getting there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what. I think I'll stick to the piano. Yeah. Uh, can I call you later for lessons? Well... Because it is a beautiful instrument. Yeah, okay. Um... It was a beautiful instrument. I'll call you back. All right.
All right. I want to thank you all for being here. We've got a great show tonight. Robert De Niro will be out in a minute. Actor, screenwriter, Charles Palmentari, and supermodel Gabriella Reese will be here, so don't go away. I'm going to try this again. My first guest began his career as a film actor in the 1969 movie, The Wedding Party. In 1974, he won an Oscar for his role in The Godfather, part two. In 1980, he won Best Actor for his portrayal of Jake LaMotta in Raging Bull. And in his most recent film, A Bronx Tale, not only does he star, but he also makes his directorial debut. He's terrific, I love him. Please welcome Robert De Niro. That's enough. <laughs> I saw the movie, as I've seen every movie of yours. I saw it last night. It's it's terrific, and uh, and you're in it and you directed it. Um, why did you choose the Bronx Tale? I mean, what was the? Uh... Well, I, I saw it out here about I must have been almost five years ago, and I uh, Chaz did it as a one man show, and he acted all the parts, and I uh, I liked it a lot, and he was terrific in it, and. Then I said, let me see a screenplay, and, and uh, he eventually showed me a screenplay, and then I had a reading at my, my place in New York in Tribeca, and then um, decided to do it, because I was, I've always wanted to do something, but it was just, I finally said I had to commit to doing something, you know, directing a movie, so yeah. I thought I could do something with it, so. One of the great things about the movie is, is are the actors in it. I mean, yeah. I haven't seen any of these actors. Where, where did you get them? I mean, well, I found I, I uh, wanted to. I mean, the subject's been done a lot, and uh, and I wanted to make it more special in terms of the people and the way to make it work. To me, was using these special. He Chaz had written great characters based on people he knew, and. Um, and it was a terrific story and structure and, and the characters were wonderful. So I just, I, I said, I don't want to go, if I can, I want to look for people who are not very well known. Uh, so... Uh, and you know, most of them are non-actors. They're I mean. all not, they're all, all non-actors, yeah. except a few of the actors uh, have had experience. Um, uh, Tommy Ford, Clem Caserta, and Joe D'Onofrio, but really very little, but they were so unique that uh, and I felt they were really used in the, the way that I'd like to see them used, or especially in um, Caserta's... Uh, do, do you, I mean, do you have any problem directing the non-actors? It's a little um, more arduous? No, I, I, I felt um, uh, comfortable with them. I, they were as good as professionals as far as I was concerned, and they were... Uh, I mean, they were in a, in a milieu, in a, in, a, in a surrounding that they knew, and the, the idea was to get people uh, who knew this world and, and uh, so that they would feel comfortable with each other. They might not have been from the same neighborhood, but they were from the same, you know, the same background. Yeah, and, uh, same basic accent. Yeah, exactly. Bronx. Like, what, a little bit. Little so Bronx that was it. So that, but it took a long time. I wanted to, I, I told the casting director, Alan Chenoweth, that I would like, you know, I really want to spend, it's not like just looking through agents and going to off-Broadway plays, but it's really hitting the streets and finding because I know they're out there finding the right people. Yeah. In the credits, I mean, they're all listed. I try to yeah. see who, do I know anybody, but not right. really what Chaz I know because he wrote it. Uh, and uh, there was also in the credit a, a lady in the window. Now, I don't know what that refers to because I couldn't find a lady in the window. So, well, the who lady was in the window. <clears throat> in the, in the, in the, uh, the first, actually, it was the, I think it was the first night of shooting, it was the first week of shooting. And the, the doo-wop group was on the corner, and there was a woman that, throughout the time that we shot there, would always, every so often, start yelling or complaining, was shooting too, too late, she started yelling and disrupt everything. You mean so while you were shooting? While we were shooting, so she said, um, 
So they were going, ooh, you know, the doo-wop. And so she says, I don't care what you're doing. Woo, 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 woo. So and she's, you know, this is like three in the morning. So we That's called nice. her the woo-woo lady. So somebody, one of the producers put her name in the credit. Yeah. I, let, let, let's run a clip of the picture. I, before I run it, I want to tell you what it is. It's basically a true story. And it, it's based on sort of the dilemma of, of, of a kid who's brought up with a father who really cares about him, but he's also very close to a member of kind of the mob. I mean, a, a... roll the clip. What are you doing driving Sonny's car? What are you talking about? What do you mean, what am I talking about? I just saw you driving Sonny's car. I don't want you driving this car around. I don't like Man, I'm that. I'm not in the mood to hear this. I don't care if you're not in the mood to hear it. We already had that thing about the bikers and that fight in that bar. And I don't want you in that bar. I told you that. What was I going to do? Run away and make people think I got no heart? You think those guys really care whether you got heart or not? I mean, what makes you think you're so special? You don't know Sonny. I don't have to know him. I know how he thinks. You up, he'll hurt you like anybody. Wrong, Sonny, trust me. That man can't trust anybody. The sooner you know that, the better. How many times do I have to tell you? People don't respect him. They fear him. There's a big difference. You want to be somebody? Be somebody who works for a living and takes care of his family. Yeah, you look away. Look, you're my only son. I'm only looking out for your best interest. But you got to know the saddest thing in life is wasting oh, time. I don't want to hear this. You don't want to hear it, but you're going to hear it. I might not have any money. I might not have a Cadillac, but I don't have to look over my shoulder. And I'm proud of what I do, and I don't answer to anybody. My mother and father came to this country with nothing. And, and they died with Hey, don't you dare disrespect your grandparents. Do you hear me? And you're wrong. They tried to give me a better life, and that's what I'm trying to do. What better life? We don't even own a car. We ain't got money. We ain't got nothing. Don't take it out of me because you're a bus driver. The working man is a sucker. Your acting has always, uh, it's always been astonishing to me, and I've always wanted to work with you in a picture, but uh, I think we go a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> you actually work, and I clown, you know. <laughs> but uh, mentioned in the clip is that uh, you're a bus driver, and I know you drove the bus in the picture, because I saw it all the time. Yes. Uh, I used to drive big rigs and trucks. Really? Uh, I was wondering if you took any lampposts out while you were working on that. What? <laughs> How did you, uh, that wasn't a stunt double, that was... <clears throat> no, I, I drove the, uh, I had to take a test, and... Uh, uh, with the uh, the motor vehicle building, and I took it twice um, because the first time they told me I failed it, and I took spent three hours and uh, taking parts of the test I didn't even have to take. Then I took it. Then they said I failed. The woman went downstairs and checked the key. Uh, that you know, I, I don't know how you describe it. The key yeah, for yeah. The, the answers and so on. So then I had to go back a few days later, and I took it again. And she came back in and shook her head. And uh, after I. Um, uh, took the test and uh, I said this is impossible. I studied this booklet, you know, for uh, it's impossible that I, uh, you know. So finally, <clears throat> she went back and checked and real. I had to call out Al uh, Albany, and uh, they found out that I was um, that I had passed not only the, the last test but the first test. I mean, it was so a DMV anyway, uh, problem. Yeah. What? What? Anyway, it was easy to drive. I mean, the only thing is that uh, Chaz Palminteri's father, Lorenzo, who the character is based on, would uh, would tell me when you're driving the bus, just watch the corners, watch the corners. Yes, yeah. so. that, that's what I meant about taking light posts out. Because yeah. when I first was driving trucks, that's what I did. Yeah. Just took yeah. one out, and I didn't know it was a fake one. Right. Are you going to direct again? Yeah, uh, probably. Do you know when? I don't know when. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we're looking forward to it. Um, one of the great things about this picture also was the soundtrack. I uh, happen to love the kind of music you kind of love, but uh, the way you did it, starting with the doo-wop group, who I like yeah. to sing with, and uh, there was jazz in it. Tell, yeah. me, tell me about that. Well, the, jazz, the music, uh, I, I uh, was very concerned. It's a great period for music, so 60, uh, 68, so I wanted to... Uh, I started listening to the oldies stations way before we started shooting, and we would have these... Uh, 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 listen to um, a lot of songs and listen to everything. And finally, you know, there's a lot of stuff we could have used, but you just finally have to make a decision. But it was the best I felt for for the uh, for the movie. And me and Butch Barbella, who wrote the original music, and wrote the original music for the play, uh, and Jeff Kimball and Chaz and 
and uh, John Killick, our, one of our producers, um, we would just constantly, constantly listen to music uh, and put it up against uh, roughly assembled scenes on videotape and just see which would be the best song or, or music, whatever, to um, and how. And, and, you know, I, I was more concerned about the, the, the feeling of the song than the lyrics. Um, <laughs> you leave us alone, we're talking. <laughs> anyway, that was so... Uh, uh, you're a very generous guy. I mean, I've known you for a long time, uh, but you're so generous to come out and give everybody else credit, and um, it's a terrific movie, and I think that the directing shows your generosity. Your acting has always shown it, but uh, it's a terrific movie, and I hope people get out and see it, and I really want to thank you for coming. Thanks. thanks. Uh, we'll be back with Chaz commentary uh, after this. guest, uh, this is a Bronx Tale night. My next guest not only stars with Bob De Niro in uh, Bronx Tale, but he also wrote the screenplay, and he is terrific in the picture. Please welcome Chaz Palminteri. Uh, gee, uh, it's, uh, again, I love the picture, and it's based on a true story. It's based on your life. Well, it's uh, based on a lot of my life. It's not absolutely true. I mean, it's, it's based on some true incidences, like, um, when I was, uh, nine years old, sitting on my stoop, I did see uh, another man shoot another man right in front of me. And, uh, it was from that incident that I always wanted to write about. Yeah. Uh, but you did, in the movie... Right. The kid who's playing you when you were a kid... Right. Uh, never turned in. Right. Well, actually, in reality, I didn't have to do that. After the, when the man shot the other guy, my father just grabbed me by my arm, pulled me upstairs, and then, uh, yeah. as any writer does, you take from real life, from what's true, you exaggerate it for dramatic purposes. Yeah. I, 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 a lot of people obviously don't know you yet, and they're gonna. Right. But uh, you were banging around a long time, and. Uh, right. I was working in. Um, well, I did a lot of theater in New York. Then I came out to L.A., and uh, I was working. Uh, as a doorman in some clubs, trying to supplement my income. Get, I would get an acting job like any actor. You run out of money, you gotta get another, you gotta, you supplement your income. So I was working as a doorman and I walked into work one day and, and I got fired. The guy said, you're fired. And I said, why? He says, well, I like to change doormen every three months. I said, okay. <laughs> I said, that's nice. I said, but you've been good to me. I shook his hand and I left. I went back to my apartment. I was living in North Hollywood, an apartment about as big as this desk here. You know, I had a car, I had a, this car with a big dent in it, you know, and uh, I get home, you know, and I realize that I'm fired. I got about 200 in the bank. And I said, okay, now what am I gonna do with my life? And uh, my father always told me, you know, my father always pushed me and always said, the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. So I was just sat there and I said, uh, I'm just not gonna, I gotta do something, something. I got up, I got into that beat up car, I went to Thrifty Drugstore on Laurel Canyon by Ventura Boulevard, and I got five legal tabs of, of, uh, of uh, paper, the yellow pads, and I started to write a, a Bronx Tale. I wrote that first the monologue, yeah. the, the killing, and I performed it at my theater, Theater West, and each week I would write all week, and then on Monday nights I would perform it in front of a live audience. And after about uh, almost nine months, I had an hour and a half of material. And then I called my friend Peter up, my friend Peter Gation, and because uh, I had no money to produce it. Yeah. Okay. So I called him up. He says, I worked for him as a doorman in 1982 at a place called the Limelight in New York. Okay. So he said, you know what? You always told funny stories. I believe in you. He sent me the money. I got some money from, from my friend Dan Loria, who was the father on the Wonder Years. I put the money together. I put on the play. And the next day, my life changed. It was over. As soon as the play, the reviews came out, every agent, 
producer, director, studio head in Hollywood was chasing me for like, it was like unbelievable. But you still held out. I mean, in fact, you wouldn't, as right. I understand yeah. it, even, even let them have the picture unless no. you could play Sonny. Right, well, they, want, they loved the thing, that, but they didn't want me to play the role. They wanted to get a star in the role of Sonny, and I said no, and they offered me six figures. But in Hollywood, when you say no, they say, oh, he means he wants more money. So they raised, they kept raising the money. And then uh, they got to seven figures, and I still said no. Yeah. I said, no, I'm, I play Sonny on no deal. So I took the play to New York. We did it in New York. I got great reviews in New York. And in the, in the midst of all this, I was writing the screenplay. And then Bob came to see it in L.A. And then he saw it again in New York, and he said, look, you'll be terrific as Sonny. He said, you should write the screenplay because you know the element. He says, I want to direct it. We'll make it, and I'll protect you, and you'll do it. He shook my hand, and we made the movie. That's great. Um, we don't have a lot of time left, but I, I, I want to ask you about Freddie Coffee Cake. I know oh, that Frankie the audience Coffee doesn't know, who the, but I, I mean Frankie Coffee Frank, Cake. Yeah, yeah. There, there was a lot of guys in the movie who never acted before, and Bob wanted to use real people. So a lot of these guys, I said to them, I, I went down to the neighborhood to get some of these guys. There was this one guy, Frankie Coffee Cake. They called him Coffee Cake because his face looked like a Drake's Coffee Cake. It was like he had all these, <laughs> yeah. he had all these pimples on his face. But actually, it was, it was actually prosthetics because, you know, they put it on, they wanted to make it look really good. But anyway, I told this guy, I said, hey, you want to be in a movie? I'm doing a movie with Robert De Niro. He goes, wow, what movie? I said, come on, just come down. This guy's a professional gambler, my friend. His name, actually, his name is Dave Solano. He's a terrific, terrific character actor. I bring him down there, right? He walks in. I bring him in to meet Bob. He walks in. He goes, so, it is you. So he thought I was kidding him, right? <laughs> so then he says to me, he says, listen, Bob, I'd love to, uh, it's nice meeting you and everything, but I got to catch the third race at Aqueduct. I hope this ain't going to be long. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, that, uh, that's serious. That's, that's serious. great. That's great. And Bob really, you know, Bob fell in love with me, and we put him in the movie. He's terrific. Great. Chaz, it's great to hey. meet you. I hope everybody sees your picture. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're coming back with news update and supermodel Gabriella, supermodel Gabriella Reese. Great. It's time now for news update with our anchor Chevy Chase. Oh, yeah, we had a great vacation. We went scuba diving and blah, 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 blah. Oh, I gotta go. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Chevy Chase. Our top story, according to this morning's USA Today poll, 55% of Americans favor Clinton's health care plan, 20% oppose it, and 25% are furious at a speech interrupted home improvement. <laughs> Many liberal Democrats have rejected President Clinton's new health care plan proposals because they prefer a single-payer system. Because they prefer a single-payer system, also known as the Canadian system, conservative Republicans, on the other hand, seem to favor the Arctic system, whereby sick people are left out in the frozen tundra to die. And after a wild two-day binge, Russian President Boris Yeltsin woke up this morning and said, I dissolved the what? <laughs> Former Iran-Contra defendant Oliver North Former Iran-Contra defendant Oliver North is now officially a candidate for the U.S. seat uh, in Virginia. In response to reporters' questions, North said he believes his experience with perjury, embezzlement, and obstruction of justice clearly make him the most qualified man for the job. <laughs> when asked uh, his views on housing, jobs, and education, North replied, I, I just don't remember, I simply can't recall, and I honestly forgot. <laughs> John uh, Shalikashvili, President Clinton's pick to succeed General Colin Powell as the nation's top military officer, said he was surprised to learn his father was a Nazi soldier in World War II. The general also said he was also surprised to learn that Shalikashvili is the Polish word for Demyanyuk. <laughs> Meanwhile, accused Nazi war criminal John Demyanyuk 
is finally back in the United States following acquittal on charges that he was death camp guard Ivan the Terrible. When asked what he planned to do, the Manyuk simply answered, I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> the Manyuk now says uh, that the trial, now that the trial is over and the world knows he is not Ivan the Terrible, he will settle down and reassume uh, his own life as Dear Abby. <laughs> And now that the Olympic Committee has decided to hold the games in Sydney, the Beijing-China Committee has told them that they've made a big mistake. One Chinese official said, quote, most of our young people are dead or in prison, so you guys could have won everything. <laughs> the space shuttle landed at the Kennedy Space Center yesterday for its first ever nighttime landing. A NASA spokesman said, for the astronauts, the only real risk in landing at night is in driving back to their Florida hotels. <laughs> The Boston Museum is going to be displaying the dinosaurs of Jurassic Park through December of 93. Charlie D. Schmidt of Crivets, Wisconsin, learned that not only were velociraptors meat eaters, they didn't floss or brush or gargle. <laughs> During his recent crusade, someone asked Billy Graham if he'd ever met God. Graham reportedly kidded no, but Oral Roberts tells me he's about this tall. And our final story, Tom Gerald of the magazine show 2020 announced he will interview a woman tomorrow who was charged in cutting off her husband's penis. Doctors later reattached the penis to the man in an attempt to save it, only to have it tragically fly off during a relay race in Manchester, Ohio next week. And that's the news tonight, and have a pleasant tomorrow. Tomorrow on the Chevy Chase Show, singer Kenny Loggins, Lois and Clark's Dean Kane, a man we call the Roadkill Gourmet, and a special appearance with 11-year-old pilot Victoria Van Meter. But stay tuned for supermodel Gabriella Reese, coming up after this. Thank you. My next guest is a unique combination of, wait a minute, that camera will be fine. Combination of uh, volleyball pro and supermodel. Take a look at this. Oh look, thank you. Watch your weight. <laughs> Take things one step at a time. <laughs> be aggressive. Boys like it when you make the first call. What? That was out! And be friendly. A winning personality can take you far in life. Okay, I'm warmed up. How about basketball? Yeah, okay. Please welcome Gabriella Reese. It's amazing how far femi feminism has come over the years, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. It's really changed uh, cat a lot. Catgalls guys are taking their pants off back there. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you like to be called? Gabriella? Gabby? Gab? Um, Gabby. Da I mean, people usually call me Gabriella, but then once you know me about a day, you call me Gabby. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll just say Gabriella. Okay, that's good. All right. I'll call you Chubby. How's that? Uh, Chevy's okay. Is Chevy? Yeah. Chase? Okay. <laughs> where, where do you come from? Where, where do you hail from? Where are you raised? What's my... Um, I was actually born in California. I never lived here. And then uh, I grew up in the Virgin Islands in St. Thomas. Uh -huh. And I went to college and played ball at Florida State. And played volleyball? Volleyball. Yeah. Well, I played football at Florida State. No, I played volleyball. And then... <laughs> and then... And then, um... I was a tight end. No, just kidding. And then, um... I lived in Miami for a while, and then when I turned pro, I moved to California to train and to yeah. play volleyball. Uh, when you turned pro? When I turned pro, yeah, because you have to be in California. That's where everyone is. Were, were you always athletic as a kid? I mean, what? 
Were you, is this you know, how? Um, I was. Uh, my mom's really tall. She's 6'3". Yeah. And so it was sort of like part of it. Uh, I wasn't sort of really ever a tomboy, but I was always uh, athletic. And then uh, I got involved with volleyball and basketball, kind of typical in my junior year, being so tall. And uh, sort of one thing led to another, and then I chose volleyball, and then went to college, and then decided I wanted to continue playing. And uh, the beach was sort of the answer. The beach was the answer. The was yeah, the I, answer. Have, I believe that. Yeah, it's a great way to make a living. I, I, have a, I have one of my daughters, in fact, all of them are tall, but one of my daughters is clearly going to be How tall very she? tall. Well, she's only 10 now, so she's uh, six one. but... No. Uh, <laughs> Don't laugh. I was six feet tall when I was 12. Six feet tall when you were 12? Absolutely. God. It's sad, isn't it? <laughs> it's not sad, it's just a... Well, what, was it hard for you? I mean, yeah, maybe you can really, give my Sydney some advice. I think it's really hard because um, everyone else, especially the boys, can you imagine how small they are, yeah. you know? And uh, you, you don't even think about dating. And then when you get into high school and finally the guys are as tall as you, they go out with the girls that are five feet tall. Yeah. So you end up going out but with a guy were, that's But like you were so obviously tall. so beautiful. No, I... Uh, but, maybe you know, not at that no, age. They're you freaked didn't... out by how tall you are. They yeah. think you're weird. You know? Yeah, particularly if you're wearing high heels. Do you wear high heels? Sometimes. Or? Sometimes I do. Like when I just uh, that figure... That puts you up there with Wilt, huh? Wilt, oh. yeah. Sorry I said that. <laughs> no. Actually, I know Wilt. <laughs> bad. Oh. That was a bad mistake. No, no, Wilt. I'm right up there with Wilt, yeah. I, I usually wear heels when I figure I'm just going to go completely over the top and be like six foot six. Yeah, me too. You do that? Yeah. <laughs> when I'm going to go over the top, yeah, yeah. Is the uh, beach volleyball season over? Or yeah, it's a summer, it's yeah. summer season. What's your standing? Um, my team, uh, we were second, second winningest team, and um, I was an MVP of 92, and then this year I, was, I wasn't the MVP. Uh, an Olympic player was, and uh, I was leader in kills and blocks. And that's what I do, kill and block. Kill meaning? meaning when you hit it, an unreturned spike, yeah. basically. Oh, when... Oh, so you block the spikes, yeah. Yeah. Don't you get bruised? You know, in the beginning, I think everybody, if you've ever done it, like bumped volleyball, it's like sensitive and funny, and then after a while, you just get used to it. Sensitive and funny, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> a lot of people call me sensitive and funny, but... They do? Yeah, I, and I got a lot of bruises, you, I know too. they call you sensitive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, come on, come on. I'm I, just kidding, I'm I just kidding. I think she was just kidding. That's was... not fair, dude, really. <laughs> How much? This is huh? all the like dirt on Gabrielle, so we're going to. There's no dirt on you that I know of. No, there isn't. A little dandruff, but. Uh... <laughs> Too shy. What about men? Do you do you, uh, uh, do you, do you like men? Them? I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> is there one in your life now that we can? Uh... Um, there is. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He's like about five foot six. Five six. Mm -hmm. I somehow I knew. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's uh. he's about my height. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Are you gonna marry him? I don't know. Uh, I'm sort of taking that as one day at a time, yeah. basically. Um, I'm still 23. Oh, well, so. I married my wife when she was 23. You did? Yes. Um, and we're well, still married. You are? Yeah. Really? You married her when she was 23? Yes. Really? Well, how I mean, old were you? Were you like... Me? Yeah, how old were you? Oh, when you gosh, I'm 24, five. <laughs> 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 hey, listen, you're really nice to come. You're Thank a you. very beautiful girl, and I hope Thank to you. see you playing uh, volleyball yeah. and uh, playing anything else you want. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Gabrielle. We'll be right back. Thank you very much, Tommy, and uh, uh, thank you, Doc Cheatham. Uh, incidentally, Doc's got his first solo album out. It's called The Legendary Pioneers of Jive, Doc Cheatham. And uh, if you can pick that up, I would suggest it. I have a short film I'd like to show you. It was made by a filmmaker friend of mine. It's uh, kind of a party for dogs, Boston Terriers. Let's take a look, won't we? Come on out, Maxine. It's time to go to your family reunion. Okay, okay, I is coming. Uh-oh, is we here already? Nice shoes. 
Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fourth annual Boston Tea Party. I mean, is this great or what? This is Boston heaven for a day. Boston heaven? That's what she thinks. My chain. My <coughs> my chain <coughs> can you loosen up on this thing a little bit <coughs> now this thing's okay at least the old bag isn't trying to kiss me oh now now cousins don't be rude introducing our legendary great-grandfather froggy he was identified on the grassy knoll in texas now retired froggy enjoys killing birds hands chest chest G get your hands off my chest now please please come on buddy Jeez, if I ate that, I'd have the runs for a week. I uh, have brother Anthony. Anthony also pees on many brands of chef parts. Uh, I sniff my butt. My, yeah, my butt. It's other end. There you go. Back a little further my butt. Yeah. <laughs> Stop. I can't dig tickling. Come on, kid. Cut it out. Perhaps you don't recognize me? I was J. Edgar Hoover's dog. <laughs> Brother Sarge buried Grandpa's teeth in the backyard. Aunt May is a world-class flagellator. Here, come this way. This you'll like. We are all very proud of Chuck, Doc, Spooky, and Ziggy when they do their famous foreign stick tricks. There they go. That's one, two, three, and four on a stick. Okay. Hey. Come back tomorrow. We're going to have Kenny Loggins. We're going to have Lois and Clark's, uh, Clark's Dean Cain, uh, the roadkill gourmet, and a history-making 11-year-old pilot, Victoria Van Meter, is going to be here with us only. We'll be right back. How John Shums... Do it for you. Uh, Robert De Niro, wonderful Chaz Palminteri, wonderful Gabriella Reese, Jock Cheatham, and Tom Scott in the Hollywood Express. Please come tomorrow, will you? Tomorrow night, Briscoe's got a date with a beautiful redhead. But will their night together be the kiss of death? Find out on an all-new Briscoe County Junior, followed by an all-new X-Files. And one week from tonight, The Simpsons are back with all new episodes, beginning with a star-studded season premiere next Thursday.